Hello, Hello everyone. Hello, everyone. Um, Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and sorry for the delay. We have some, some technical difficulties which we're, we're hoping to sort out, but we're going to start. Um, uh, my name is Jonathan Coleman. I'm the editor of Australian Foreign Affairs. I would like to start by acknowledging, celebrating, and paying my respects to the Ngunnawal and Ngambri people of the Canberra region and to all First Nations Australians on whose traditional lands we meet and work and whose cultures are among the oldest continuing cultures in human history. Um, well, thanks all for coming. It's great to be here after um, a long break between events for AFA and Canberra. Um, it's great to have here tonight uh, Mari Schwartz, the publisher of Australian Foreign Affairs, and Anna Schwartz, great to have you both. Um, Alan Hinchel is up there, our consulting editor. Um, thanks for being here. And um, uh, thanks all for joining us for the launch of uh, our latest issue, the Taiwan Choice Showdown in Asia, uh, which looks at the growing tensions in Taiwan. It looks at the prospects for a war in Taiwan and how these tensions are reshaping Asia and what this means for Australia and what Australia can do about it. Um, and uh, we have an incredible lineup of speakers to discuss this tonight. So I'll introduce them to you from uh, the far end to the near end. Um, Hugh White is Emeritus Professor of Strategic Studies at the ANU. He's a multiple contributor to AFA. Uh, his essay in this issue argues that Taiwan cannot be defended by the US and that this has major consequences both for Asia and for the US-Australia alliance. Um, next we have Jay Duan. Jay is a lecturer in strategic studies at Deakin University and an expert on Chinese foreign policy and history and the international politics of East Asia. She's currently researching the prospects of a conflict over Taiwan in the 2020s from the perspectives of the players in the region. Um, next we have Brendan Taylor. Uh, he is Professor of Strategic Studies at the Strategic and Defence Studies Centre at ANU. His essay in this issue is called The Equation and it looks at China's options for taking over Taiwan and what countries like Australia can try to do to soothe tensions in the Taiwan Strait. Uh, Linda Jacobson, fresh back from uh, Europe. Linda, it's great to have you here. Um, Linda is the founding director and deputy chair of China Matters. Her piece in this issue, Unfinished Business, examines how the Chinese Communist Party and how Xi Jinping viewed Taiwan and whether and even when she might attempt to make a move against Taiwan. Um, we also potentially, depending on our technical um, prowess, uh, have Dr. Ai Chun Lai, um, who you may have seen on screen earlier. He is the president of the Prospect Foundation. Uh, that's a think tank in Taiwan. He has served in various leading foreign policy and China positions for the Democratic Progressive Party. Um, and finally, I'm delighted to uh, introduce our moderator, Stephen Zetzic, who is foreign affairs reporter for the ABC a sharp and keen observer of Australian foreign affairs. Um, I'm delighted that he also has an essay in this issue. It looks at the China debate in Australia, and whether there's a generational divide that is shaping views on China. And it's, it's a must read. We won't be talking about it so much tonight, but, um, but I recommend you, you um, take a look at it. Um, before we begin, I would just like to thank Michelle Ferreira at ANU and the team for um, for all your support and for making this happen tonight. Thanks, Michelle. <laughs> and um, uh, um, thanks again uh, for coming. It's great to be back here again after a long break. And Stephen, I'll hand over to you. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, um, can, can you hear me up the back? Is that clear? All right, I'm gonna try and project. Um, thanks so much for coming to what I hope will be a really engaging uh, and interesting discussion with some absolute first-class minds, uh, taking a look at one of the most important uh, and difficult foreign policy questions confronting the globe. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm, I'm not going to try and do a sort of full reprise of everything, but I'm conscious that not everyone in the room has necessarily read the full um, AFA yet, so what I might do 
is I might offer or start off just with a question to all of our panelists, um, in particular those starting with those who have essays in this AFA, just asking them to draw out some of the key themes and, and points uh, that they've, they've made. And so, look, I'll get straight to it and go straight to, to Hugh um, right at the other end. Now, I've pulled out one quote here, um, Hugh, and I know it's, it's just one, but I, I figure it's the one that gets to the heart of the, the point that you're making, and it's this, quote, America's promise to defend Taiwan is no longer strategically or militarily credible, and maintaining it does more harm than good. And further, you go on to say that Australia should recognize this and, quote, make it clear to Washington and Taipei publicly and privately that it does not support such promises to defend Taiwan, uh, and it would not join America in a war over Taiwan. Mm -hmm. Now, can you lay out, please, Hugh, why you think uh, that America's promise, uh, such as it is within the, the framework of strategic ambiguity, uh, is not credible, and why you think that Australia should make this declaration to both Washington and to Taipei. Yeah, look, thanks, Stephen, and thanks, Jonathan and Murray, a chance to be here, and thank you, everyone, for coming. Look, one of the real challenges in this business is to establish the correct connection between the broad strategic, the grand strategic questions, and for that matter, the sort of moral and political questions that flow from them, including the sense that we have a moral obligation to support a democracy like Taiwan, on the one hand, and the harsh military realities on the other. And in the end, the harsh military realities are like engineering problems. They're just, they're just physical facts. The fact is that for a very long time, until probably a decade ago, the, the United States superiority in air and maritime capabilities meant that the United States had a very good chance of being able to win a war with China over Taiwan and effectively defend Taiwan. And that's just no longer the case anymore. Now, of course, wars are always uncertain. They always surprise Vladimir Putin has discovered. <laughs> um, but, you know, one's got to make a judgment on the basis of, uh, of the evidence available, and it's very broadly accepted now, that uh, China can effectively deny the maritime approaches to Taiwan to US ships and aircraft. It would take a lot of uh, hits in a US-China conflict that China would take a lot of hits, but the Americans would take a lot of hits too, and the Americans could not put enough, impose enough pain on China to make the Chinese stop. So America can't win. And what's worse, by failing to win a conventional war, the risk that it escalates to a nuclear war is very great. Uh, I think much higher than most, other, m most people understand. I, I do think we have to be incredibly careful about the idea of starting conventional war between nuclear powers. We have no experience of this, but all the evidence of the Cold War is that once a conventional war gets going, a nuclear war is not very far behind. So I think we need to be extremely careful about that. What that means is that much as we might like to be able to defend Taiwan, the military reality is that we can't. And I don't think that's a military reality that can be reversed simply by spending another percent of GDP on defence or whatever got very deep to the deeper features of the operational and technological balance. And if that's so, then it's a really dumb idea for the United States to, to base the credibility of its position in Asia on its ability to fulfil a promise that I don't believe it can fulfil. And what's worse, by basing its credibility on it, it increases the, the temptation for the United States to go to war over Taiwan, even if it's not going to win. And, go, and starting a war that you're not going to win is a really dumb idea. We Anglo-Saxons don't have much experience of losing wars, at least for the last couple of centuries. So we tend not to put as much emphasis on this. But I think it's a really fundamental question. You don't start a war, you haven't got a reasonable chance of winning. And in Australia's case, you don't join a, a war that you don't have a reasonable chance of winning. That has very big and very gloomy implications for the future of US power in Asia very gloomy implications for the future of Australia's dependence on US power as a foundation for our for the, for the Asian order and our place in it. But that's why I conclude, as you mentioned in that quote, that we should discourage the United States from promising this, discouraging the United States from fulfilling the promise if the test comes and, and recognise what this means for the future order in Asia and start adapting to it now.
All right. Look, I'd, I'd really like to come back to quite a few of those uh, threads, but I'll, I'll move on for the moment and we'll revisit some of them. Linda, I might go to you next. I'll, I've, I've got a quote here. Um, you argue that Beijing will use, quote, all means short of war to take back Taiwan. Uh, there's also the prospect it uses the, the means of war as well. But let's focus on the means short of war, uh, at least for now. Uh, can you describe what you mean by that? What sort of tactics are already being used and what tactics are currently being contemplated by the Chinese leadership to try and wrestle control of Taiwan? Okay, lovely to be here. Thank you to AFA for having me and letting me write that essay. Um, I have two key points before I come to what it's gonna look like, and they're very brief. One is that Xi Jinping has said clearly that he wants to see reunification in his lifetime. He said, we cannot, we can no longer leave the Taiwan issue to future generations. And in this, is a clear difference from his predecessors. So we, we can expect movement on the Taiwan issue. Second one is Xi Jinping doesn't want war. He wants to be able to see or oversee reunification, as the people in the PRC say, in a way that doesn't lead to war. Um, he wants stability. He wants prosperity. He is not hankering after war. And I think that's a point that many of the analysts have got wrong. And why then do I say that he will use all means short of war? So what are those means? They're means such as taking out the communication system, taking out the lights, um, stirring up internal domestic um, clashes within Taiwanese society, um, possibly a bl blockade, or a partial blockade. Now I know we're already on the brink of actions which are considered war actions, but all means short of war means to stir up so much chaos within Taiwanese society that the political leadership will buckle and say, <coughs> okay, we will negotiate. Because after all, they have been told, all that the Beijing is asking for is to negotiate. They aren't saying you have to reunify tomorrow. What they're asking for is, without preconditions, you will come to the table and have political talks about reunification. Now, in the essay, in the AFA, I also, besides taking out the lights and putting huge pressure um, on Taiwanese society, I envision possibly um, 100,000 fishermen, unarmed, going across from Fujian province um, towards Taiwan is a democratic society going to mow down 100,000 unarmed fishermen? Of course, most of these fishermen would then be guerrillas who would come on shore and, and stir up trouble. Um, so I think this constant pressure, which will intensify and lead to, in the mind of Xi, to an agreement to start talks is what he aims for. Now, there could be a missile that goes astray, kills 20 people. I'm not saying there won't be bloodshed. Um, and at any moment during a very intensive campaign like this, um, we could slip into a war situation um, by miscalculations, misinterpretations, and so on. So all means short of war could actually lead to war, but I think this is what they will, in the beginning, try. And my last point here is that each action that they take, it'll be like salami slicing, like we've seen in the South China Sea. No one action will warrant a response from the United States militarily. Um, it, no one action will bring the whole region up in arms against Beijing. So they'll, they'll be able to bit by bit slice away and, and create that turmoil, which at the end, in Xi's eyes, will lead to an agreement to talk. All right. Um, Brendan, I might go to you next um, because we're coming to the, well, it's, a, it's not a cheery read, the opening of, for those who haven't read the opening uh, sections of Brendan's piece, it deals with the prospect of a hot war in the Strait and what that war might look like, including the horrible possibility of a nuclear conflict and the cataclysmic results that would flow from that. Brendan, can I get you to lay out just briefly what a hot war might look like in the Strait, what the consequences 
um, of that might be. I'll, I'll, uh, I'll read a, a brief quote here as well on top of that. Um, after that, you talk a lot about, given the cataclysmic consequences of a hot war, the importance of diplomacy. You say Australia really needs to put the shoulder to the wheel in terms of regional diplomacy to try and do everything possible to forestall war. Um, you say here that Australia, as part of that, should prioritise trying to, quote, establishing a high-level diplomatic channel to Beijing to influence China's behaviour. Can you expand? I know there were other measures you talked about there, but can you expand in particular on that suggestion? Why did you nominate that? And why do you think that Australia could potentially exert any influence of, at all on this question, given the crushing you know, forces of history and geopolitics at play? Well, thanks, thanks very much, Stephen. If I could also add to my thanks, the very last live event that I did was exactly two years ago in, in Melbourne with, um, with Jonathan. So Jonathan, thanks so much for having me back, and it's lovely to, to finally see you again after all this, uh, this time. I mean, I think you know the last two years have been have been pretty difficult um, for for all of us. Um, the bad news is that if, if Hugh's scenario eventuates and we do end up um, with um, Taiwan escalating um, beyond the you know a Taiwan conflict escalating to the nuclear level, uh, the bad news is is that the last two years will will seem pale by comparison. It's like, a um, cheery thought. Yes, I mean it's not, and it's not um, you know it's not that un unlikely a, a, a prospect. Um, you know, I think we, we won't be talking about things like petrol prices. We'll actually be, you know, potentially talking about things like, you know, where there actually being no, no petrol at, at the Bowser. Um, we won't be talking about, you know, food food prices of, you know, sort, sorts of issues like um, supply chains and those sorts of things would have been magnified um, by, you know, to a very significant degree. So I think that, you know, that's something we, we certainly want to to, evolve, um, to avoid. What, what really worries me is that the, the kind of the scenario that, that Linda sketches out, the kind of all, all measures short of war or kind of um, verging on, on war, to go from that point to, to what he was is, um, uh, describing, I, I think um, in the current age, um, and, and unlike the, the Cold War, um, I think we could escalate from, from what Linda's describing to what he was describing you know, very, very quickly because of the different technologies that are, that are, that are being used. Um, uh, and I'm very happy to go into detail on um, on those. Um, but I also think that these are issues that, that aren't really being sufficiently grasped by either side of, of politics in, in Australia at the moment. On the one hand, we have uh, Peter Dutton coming out and saying that you know conflict is, um, you know, it, it would be inevitable in the case of conflict for Australia to, to side with the United States. On the, the other hand, we have um, you know uh, those on the other side of politics, such as as Penny Wong saying. Um, you know, we, we really need to do what we can to preserve the status quo. I, d I just don't think that either of those positions are, are sustainable. I think Dutton is asking the, is posing the wrong, the wrong question. I think if we get to that point where there is a conflict, it, it's, it's going to be a war that nobody wins and it, it won't really matter, particularly if it escalates to the, the nuclear level. And I think that's a, you know, Hugh's right, that that's a very likely scenario. On the other hand, I think that the, and Linda talks about this in, in her wonderful essay, I think the status quo that has managed to kind of keep the peace um, across the Taiwan Straits for really since the, the, the period since um, uh, 1949 onwards is, is now un unravelling. And I think um, you know, China's assertiveness is a big part of that story, but also the, the pushback from the US and, and its allies, um, and also from uh, even from Taiwan, understandably, does heighten the risk of, um, of, of conflict. And so what my argument in the, in the essay is, is that um, Australian leaders should really be doing much more, uh, making a, a much more concerted effort, um, and not necessarily unilaterally, um, in concert with other powers in, in the region, um, you know, Japan, Singapore, South Korea, Indonesia, other players who would be equally, if not more, affected by um, the sort of conflict situation um, that, that, we're, that we're talking about, that, um, that, that really that the, um, the need for a, a kind of a, a diplomatic solution to, to avoid this um, this sort of um, conflict, or at least to reduce the risk of such a conflict, I think should be a, really a priority for, for Australia's leaders right now. And how about that idea? It just caught my notice, the idea of a, of a, of a hotline or some sort of mm. high-level diplomatic channel between Canberra and, and, and Beijing. Why, yeah. why, why do you suggest that? Yeah, well, I mean, the hotline might not necessarily be between Canberra and, and, and Beijing, but I suppose I'm um, slightly more optimistic than, than Hugh is, not much more optimistic, but slightly more optimistic yeah. about where the, where the balance of power, the correlation of forces between 
the US um, and Taiwan and the US allies on the one hand and, and China is on, on the other hand. I think that, that China still has about another seven or eight years before it, it reaches a point where, where I think Hugh says that China is at right now where it, where it can uh, com be confident that not only it can prevent the US from intervening to defend Taiwan, but also where it develops the kind of the, the, the sea lift and other, other capacities to, to be able to be confident that it could um, in, invade, um, invade Taiwan. I think during that window, there's a, a much greater chance of uh, a kind of an inadvertent escalation. You know, as Linda says, events kind of spiraling out of control. But I think there will be quite an important um, tipping point at that seven or eight year mark and we kind of get ourselves into into Hughes scenario. In, in that window, I think that's where things like hotlines, where militaries, where governments can communicate with one another to avoid uh, escalation occurring or um, if they're in a crisis situation to uh, to ensure that or to try and reduce the risk of misperceptions and miscalculations, I think that's where those could be valuable. So at least for the next seven to eight years, I think that in partnership with others in the region, this is the, the sort of thing that, that Australia should be um, advocating for the use of these measures. Thanks. Um, Jade, I might come to you now, please. There's a slightly ancillary point, but a really interesting one. You talk about in a Lowy piece, you don't, of course, have a piece in AFA, but in a really interesting Lowy piece you wrote recently, you talked about the influence that Australia could actually assert in Washington in the event of, if not a full crisis, perhaps in the lead up to a crisis. And I'll just quote briefly saying, the precise manner in which Canberra could exert its influence over its superpower ally prior to and during a conflict in the Taiwan Strait now requires more urgent attention. I'd really like if it's possible for you to elaborate a little bit on that point. What sort of attention should Australia pay here? What sort of role, I mean, I presume you'll say Australia could potentially play a moderating influence, but what sort of role do you believe that Australia could or should play in the event of a crisis in terms of its uh, relationship with, uh, with Washington? Uh, thank you. <coughs> thank you, everyone. Um, it's really great to be here with first uh, class uh, experts uh, on this. Uh, I think there are more qualified uh, speakers uh, than myself to uh, talk about this uh, here, but really a uh, great honor to, uh, to be here. Um, I, I think that's a really great question. Um, when I wrote that, um, it's really kind of, I was disturbed by um, um, sort of, uh, um, you know, the, I think it's in the context of the um, uh, the COVID inquiry. I think uh, Australian, you know, did that uh, unilaterally, um, and then that uh, that uh, resulted in pushback from the mainland China, which I think a lot mm -hmm. of commentators already expressed that actually Australian government could do a better job to do that with uh, you know all the regional stakeholders. stakeholders. So when that the, you know the the, uh, the drum of war beating that claim uh, came up, I, I thought, oh no, we, we shouldn't repeat that kind of uh, scenario again. China, uh, Australia should be you know isolated, or Australia just uh, do a diplom diplomacy uh, unilaterally. This is this is the World Health Organization probe proposed yes, exactly. by Bruce Payne famously on Instagram. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, uh, so I, I, I think in that context, I, I wrote the piece. I think I quite agree with uh, Brendan, uh, you know, argued in his uh, article. It, it, I, you know, I'm a person really favor uh, diplomatic power and uh, multilateralism. Uh, so I, I think uh, Australian uh, really should be uh, careful and apply more wisdom on this, not just uh, you know work by itself, but uh, uh, it's a, it's an ally of the United States. Uh, it can I think uh, regular um, meetings and conversations with its uh, um, uh, counterparts. So I think Australia should uh, pass its views or its positions, concerns. Um, not only as Australia itself, but because uh, Australia is in a very important strategic position in the South Pacific to, you know, to bring all those kind of views that has to its uh, allies and make a, a smart you know, choice. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Do we have Dr. Lai on the, the line? 
but uh, thanks for having me here. I think the uh, uh, probably the topic about it is that the um, uh, whether uh, the uh, China Taiwan uh, the uh, the kind of the warfare uh, when would that come and how Taiwan can be defended and uh, the likelihood for the uh, the Chinese use force against Taiwan and also Chinese policy toward Taiwan. Um, I would have to say that um, I just let us back a little bit. Uh, just look at the the involvement of the post Cold War Chinese policy toward Taiwan. Uh, we have three leaders, uh, Jiang Zemin and Wu Jintao and uh, Xi Jinping. Uh, in the Jiang Zemin time, there was a 1995-1996 uh, Taiwan Strait crisis. In the Hu Jintao's time, there is no such thing. And in Xi Jinping, of course, uh, since the year 2016, uh, the uh, uh, military uh, tension started to rise. And uh, even uh, right now, we, we saw that the rise uh, dramatically. But then if you look at those three, uh, the most successful policy in Chinese view toward Taiwan, and that get the uh, most scared among the Taiwan uh, Taiwanese government, is actually under the, the Hu Jintao's time. That the Hu Jintao was able to lure a lot of the Taiwanese, uh, not only investments, but also the, uh, the so-called the people about how they feel about China. If you uh, do the opinion survey at that time, that although the government feel that the uh, uh, the Chinese government policy uh, attitude toward Taiwan, uh, the people sometimes they have the gap uh, in terms of their perception regarding their uh, view about Chinese people as well as Chinese government, whether they are uh, very hostile or the uh, less hostile toward Taiwan. So uh, it is very ironic that um, uh, in Jiang Zemin as well as Xi Jinping's time that the both uh, leader has a certain uh, level of the military and harassment. Uh, but uh, it is Hu Jintao and under his time that uh, no such things, but uh, it seems that the, uh, the policy toward Taiwan, at least uh, uh, according to many outsiders, as well as big, uh, the uh, analysts in Taiwan, the Hu Jintao seems to be the, the one that achieved the most, uh, su to be the most successful one. And then that uh, tells us something, that is the, um, uh, when the Chinese, uh, about the unification of Taiwan, of course, it has been their long-term policy since 1949. But uh, the, uh, there are various uh, periods of the appearance uh, in terms of the method. But then uh, I think one of the issues we could actually deduce from those developments is that uh, China, uh, if they are very uh, rich, uh, they could the economy try to lure Taiwan into unifications. And that's exactly what Hu Jintao was doing. Uh, he tried to showcase to the Taiwanese people about how rich, how wonderful, and uh, how successful the China state is. So that the, uh, um, the Taiwan, you could uh, join that uh, there's so much uh, prosperity that uh, you, can, you, you can have. Uh, <clears throat> but, and, and also there's another issue that's regarding the, um, uh, uh, the economic opportunities. Uh, at that time, Hu Jintao's period that the China actually present to a lot of Taiwanese people as the way, uh, area for a lot of economic success. Uh, the, uh, even some of people, they believe that the economic future of Taiwan is actually in China. And also in terms of the, how the uh, China could uh, terrorize Taiwan into submissions, uh, the, uh, I think that element did not work well, whether that is in Jiang Zemin or in the, in the Xi Jinping's time. And so that right now, the uh, increasing level of the military usage against Taiwan uh, is sort of indicate that, first of all, China lost the kind of Trump offensive against Taiwan, that the Trump appeal to Taiwan, uh, that's no longer there. And second, the kind of economic opportunity, uh, and Chinese, uh, and yes, the economic opportunity for Taiwan is also, uh, also lost its appeal. If you look at the uh, Ministry of Economic Affairs in Taiwan, Right now, one of the ma their major uh, tasks or major business is to help the Taiwanese investment and Taiwan businessmen uh, to safely get out of China. And uh, I, since I was on one of the review board that uh, we just received so many requests from the Taiwan businessmen operating in China and asking that uh, what, what is the best way or the kind of safest way for them to be able to uh, get out of China because by now Chinese, uh, first of all, they are not uh, that welcome in Thai investment anymore. And second, the, uh, uh, for the, uh, using China as an area for the exports, uh, we, they started to bump into all the questions regarding the US, China, the trade war and all, that, all those. And third, if the China as a market, and the market only uh, work for the, uh, the Chinese, the indigenous Chinese there, uh, rather than for the Taiwanese, they uh, try to sell things in China. So that economic appeal is also losing. 
And the way that the Xi Jinping is using the military forces actually uh, demonstrate that the uh, China is now uh, losing all the other the uh, method on appeal and also probably losing some of the strength so that they have nothing but using military to terrorize Taiwan into submissions. Uh, right, uh, Dr. Lai, I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt. I'm, I'm, just, um, I'm just hearing that we, we are actually struggling to hear you, a, a few people up the back in particular. I'm sorry, this is entirely a technical gremlin. It's of no fault of yours. Uh, but people up the back, I'm told, are struggling a little bit to hear you. I might, if it's okay, just get the moderators to see if we can come up with a bit of a fix to get you some better audio uh, and come back to you later in the discussion. I apologise for that. Um, but you are audible in the first half and not in the back. Um, so I'm just conscious that's neither fair to you uh, nor half of our audience. So let me let me come back to you, and I apologise. Um, can we just briefly uh, take a bit of a turn to a slightly um, tangential question, but one that's obviously really pressing, and that is, of course, the events in Ukraine um, at the moment. Um, there's been a lot of talk about how the Chinese leadership what lesson, how they are watching events in Ukraine, what lessons they may already be starting to draw from events in Ukraine. Um, Linda, I'd like to come to you on this first and then go to the others. What impact do you think events in Ukraine at the moment are having on the calculus uh, in, 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 China, in China's leadership? And can you talk a little bit about the parallels that do and don't exist between the situation in Ukraine and across the strait? Well, uh, this is something I've been giving a lot of thought to over the last two weeks, um, especially um, being in Finland, where um, events in Ukraine have been quite traumatic um, to watch. But let's start with the first question. Um, there's no doubt, of course, that Xi Jinping and other senior leaders of the Communist Party of China are watching the events um, in Ukraine extremely carefully, as is the whole world. But obviously with in mind a possible um, conflict over Taiwan. And um, I think the whole bureaucracy, the research world, the think tank world is now geared to understanding um, what went well from the point of view of Russia and what went poorly. And, and there'll be numerous, innumerable uh, reports and internal deliberations on about this. So there's no doubt that China is watching very carefully what's going on. But one of the things I'd like to point out, if I come to your second question, Stephen, is what's similar when you think about China wanting to reunify with Taiwan and, and what's going on at the moment uh, between Russia and Ukraine. Um, and one of the things that it's, it's understandable that the world media has been commenting on this. But one of the points that is missing, which is absolutely fundamental when you start thinking about any comparison between these um, one event and one possible event, is that approximately one week before Russia did invade Ukraine, the President of the United States, Joe Biden, came out and says, we will not use force. We will not send our military in to Ukraine, we will not defend Ukraine. That is a huge difference to the calculus going on in Beijing when they contemplate either all means short of war, knowing that it could spiral into a real war, or contemplate uh, outright invasion attack on China. Um, the ambiguity of the United States policy towards Taiwan has been the foundation of this triangular relationship um, ever since 1979, when Beijing and Washington uh, formed diplomatic relations and officially, at least, turned their backs on Taipei. Um, so there's going to be no statement in any circumstances. I, I don't usually say anything this with certainty, but there's going, not going to be a statement by the United States president that we will not come to the defense of Taiwan under any circumstances. Um, so it's a completely different calculus from Beijing's point of view um, when they think about it. Mm. Um, Hugh, I might go to you next on this. What, what, I mean, it's very early days. We have no idea what's going to happen. We don't have a clear idea of what's going to happen in Russia and Ukraine over the next few weeks, let alone months, let alone then extrapolating out to Taiwan. But are there any lessons 
or are there any observations you'd like to make at this very early stage? Oh yes, I think there are some very important lessons. I completely agree with Linda that the most important thing about the Ukraine crisis so far is that the United States declared so categorically that it was not going to intervene. And, and indeed, back in December, mm. Biden said that, right at the beginning of the process. Um, and I think that's terribly significant for Chinese calculations because going back to some of the things that Brendan and Melinda touched on, uh, Xi Jinping doesn't want to fight for Taiwan. Of course, he doesn't want a war with America. What he wants is for America to back off. And he wants America to back off, not just because that gives him Taiwan without the cost and expense and danger of a war, but because in the process he humiliates the United States, demonstrates the United States promises to defend people in the Western Pacific uh, are not reliable, and therefore not just undermines America's position in relation to Taiwan, but undermines America's position in relation to both its allies, Japan, South Korea, Australia, and other partners. In other words, if you want to if you're sitting in Zhongnanhai in Beijing and you want to undermine American strategic leadership in, in East Asia and take its place, the best thing you can do is to create a situation in which America has committed itself to do something and then does some death. That's catnip. And so to, to me, the really striking thing, and so I'm drawing the, 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 the with great hesitance, so I'm drawing a diametrically opposite conclusion from Linda. I think sitting in Zhongnanhai, what the Chinese see is that America uh, notwithstanding, of course, the fact that Ukraine is not an ally, but then again, neither is Taiwan, yeah. America has not been willing to go to war over Ukraine for a very simple reason. It can't win. And although the operational circumstances are different, the basic calculation is the same. That is, the United States cannot project and sustain enough power in the theatre of war to give itself a high level of confidence of being able to prevail. And there's a very significant danger of escalating the nuclear exchange. Now, that is just exactly what I think is also the case. Uh, already being a bit gloomier than Brendan um, in in the in the theatre and so in 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 the Taiwan Strait. So I think what I fear is that Xi Jinping, looking at the way in which both, it's worth making the point, just not just the US but also the rest of NATO, because the rest of NATO have said they're not fighting either. Uh, over all the talk about oh you know we must have Ukraine in NATO or at least we must have give Ukraine the option of being in NATO, they in the end haven't been prepared to fight for it, and the Russians have. And I think that increases the Beijing's, it, there's a danger that that increases Beijing's confidence that when push comes to shove, when the Chinese impose a blockade, for example, which I do think is the most likely military scenario, when the, when the president faces the choice as to whether or not he's going to deploy the Seventh Fleet to break the Chinese blockade, and initiated what, would, what I think would then escalate into a major regional war, the president looks down the barrel of that very big gun and says, no. Nah. The, 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 the fact that, that, that Biden made that judgment in relation to Ukraine, I fear will increase Xi's confidence that he will make that judgment in relation to, to Taiwan. That will encourage him to give it a go. And that will then present a US president with a truly disastrous choice between mm -hmm. either going, starting a war he can't win or not starting a war, stepping back from the conflict, having the credibility of America's strategic position in Asia very significantly undermined, I would say, destroyed. And the really tragic thing is that whichever choice he makes, America's position as a leading power in Asia is screwed, which is, of course, exactly what Xi Jinping wants. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm just, I'm really keen to get to questions because I'm conscious that uh, with so many speakers, we've, uh, we've, we don't have much time, but just one very last one. I might go to Jade and, and Brendan on this. Strategic ambiguity. Um, there's been, there have been numerous instances, two at least, maybe even three, where President Biden has delivered what could be called gaffes, seemingly, to di seemingly ditching the, the mm -hmm. prospect of uh, strategic ambiguity, saying at least in one famous town hall that no, America does have a commitment to, to uh, defend Taiwan if it's attacked, uh, then subsequently walked back by the White House Press Secretary. It's happened two, maybe three times, um, leading to a lot of speculation that this is quite deliberate on the part of the administration. Um, and then, of course, in Australia, you've also got a situation where Peter Dutton declares, as Hugh's already touched on, that it's inconceivable uh, that Australia wouldn't join with the United States in the defence of Taiwan were China to launch an attack. And then that was subsequently walked back um, over a series of interviews most decisively uh, a couple of weeks ago. 
Um, I might start with you, Brendan, and then Jade after that. What do you make of this looseness of language? Is this just ill discipline? Um, is that startling given the stakes <laughs> that, are, that we're looking at here? Um, or should we perhaps read something else into it, a deliberate ploy by the Americans and perhaps even by, by Peter Dutton, even given how marginal we are in all of these equations, um, to introduce, just inject a little bit more uncertainty into mm. uh, Beijing's mind? Yeah, I think, I think that's right on your last point, um, Stephen. And I, I think what, what your question really hones in on is, is you know, obviously the, the, the kind of the main kind of fundamental driver of tensions uh, over Taiwan is kind of China's growing assertiveness that, that we've seen, you know, over the, uh, re really, as, as Linda points out, really since Xi Jinping became uh, leader of China and kind of had this kind of, you know, step change in terms of, um, you know, saying that this issue can't be passed from, from generation to to generation, and we've seen kind of Chinese coercion uh, of Taiwan really increase during that time. I think that's well understood. That's kind of well documented. I think what isn't as well documented or, or as acknowledged is kind of um, uh, that there are, are things that the uh, that the US is, is doing that's um, that's also exacerbating this tension and, and challenging the status quo. So even though officially the US has said that its position hasn't changed, it, it remains that kind of traditional position of, of not guaranteeing that it would come to Taiwan's defence, but at the same time not, not saying that it wouldn't, that kind of the essence of, of strategic ambiguity. I think that if, if you look at what's happened really starting in the, the Trump administration, um, you know, right back to those early days when Trump was elected and he took a phone call from, from President Tsai Ing-wen congratulating him on, on being elected, um, through to the, you know, the record levels of arms that um, the $18 billion worth of arms that Trump had, um, Trump approved for, for sale to to Taiwan, right to those dying days of the, the Trump administration when the Secretary of State Mike Pompeo relaxed kind of diplomatic restrictions that had, had been in place. Yeah. Um, Which got buried, but, it's, <laughs> but in retrospect, yeah, it's yeah, partly it because much the, more consequential. Yeah, it's right? partly because yeah. the US Capitol building was being stormed at that yeah, time. Which was distracting. I think what's mm -hmm. really mm -hmm. taken me by surprise um, is the extent to which that trajectory has continued on into the Biden administration. To be honest, I it's, it's very rare for an academic to ever say that they were wrong, but I, I think that in <laughs> In this situation, I expected a degree of moderation or pulling back from the Biden administration. But if anything, we've seen that that position can continue. And I think that that, that kind of doubling down, that kind of attempt to strengthen deterrence, um, I think it will it will be sustainable for you know maybe another seven to eight years. I think after that point, as the, the kind of the military balance really starts to shift, you know, if, if Hugh's right, it's already shifted. If I'm right, it, it'll start to really tilt significantly around about. That point, I think at that point, those those US guarantees, uh, that that kind of more uh, clear position that the US is trying to stake out becomes less and less credible. And I think that's one of the reasons why you're seeing uh, US leaders and officials really double down now because they realise that window is is, is closing and um, and will have closed and you know by the end of the decade. Yeah. Uh, Jay, any thoughts of you on that, on that just, question uh, before uh, we go to questions? Yeah, thank you. Please. I just the two thoughts. The first one is uh, on the uh, strategic ambiguity. I think that uh, have been played by all the three governments, uh, mm -hmm. China, PRC governments, mm -hmm. the Taiwan government, yeah. and the United States. Uh, so th I think the, the three, it seems very odd. I think the three governments have been playing uh, or have emphasized how important about, about the verbal formulation uh, from the start of the 90s. Uh, 72, the first uh, China-US uh, communique to, you know, the uh, 82, uh, the Shanghai communique. Uh, but equally, I think uh, Taiwanese played that as well. What does independence mean? I think it uh, goes back and forth. Mm -hmm. In the Chen Shui Bian's time, they have a, a referendum, but then that's Taiwanese independence in the name of Taiwan. And then I think uh, now Taiwan plays that more problem, uh, programmatically, it's actually, I think, a pursue uh, de facto independence. So, but they never, I think uh, it's clear what is independence really mean and what is uh, really one China mean. So I think these are played by three governments. The second point I would like to make is I think, yeah, um, in terms of uh, the military or the jet flights uh, over uh, the so-called Taiwan's uh, uh, air identification uh, zone. It is true, China, uh, the PRC has increased the numbers, the uh, frequencies, uh, 
But I think uh, regarding Beijing's position on Taiwan, it has uh, you know, never as non-assertive from the 50, 50s, you know, two Taiwan crisis, to 90s, the third Taiwan crisis, to 2005, the anti-secession law. They are, I think they are all very assertive behavior. Um, so I think that's very consistent. And we should, I think, consider China's position really seriously. It takes that as a core national interest. It's a, as I think as the audience are familiar with Chinese official document, it's an internal issue. Uh, so I think when I said we should pursue like multilateralism in diplomatic power, but on the other hand, we also should be careful not to uh, project, you know, we try to internationalize this issue to humiliate Beijing. Uh, I think that's a very hard, tight rope we are walking um, on this matter. All right. Look, can you please join me in thanking our wonderful panel for all the Also, thank you so much to the AFA, Maurice Schwartz, yep. uh, Jonathan Pullman and others for hosting this and also for, uh, for your sterling work with the AFA, uh, yep. which is a wonderful publication, which uh, we're all delighted to contribute to. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much for coming.